So let's hit Genesis 3. We're going to finish off. Remember the first week, Genesis 1? Second week, of course, Genesis 2. Now we're up to Genesis 3, obviously. Um, is it there? Bingo. Did I have to turn you on? Is that what? Did I, did I use that? What was that thing from Star Trek? Did I do the Jedi mind trick on you? Um, so um, we had to break up Genesis 3. We had to talk about the fall, and now, and now we're going to talk about the rescue. And the whole, the whole point of this whole series is to show you just in three chapters of Genesis God's ridiculously overpowering, lavish love that he has towards his people. Because I think if you fall in love with him, you'll fall in like with him. And I think if you fall in like with him, you'll trust him. And I think if you trust him, you'll obey him. I don't think you should start with, hey, obey the Lord. I, I, don't, I don't think that works. That works for a season. You can make your kids obey you. You're big. You're strong. You pay their bills. And then they leave and they don't want to talk to you. So it doesn't work, does it? But if they fall in love with you, then they might trust you. If they trust you, then when you tell them what to do, they'll be like, well, Dad loves me. Why would he tell me anything bad? Is this making sense? So I think the key is to, to, for you to get a revelation of God's great love. But you have to really believe it. You need a revelation. And that I can't do. That I can't do. Only the Lord can do that. Only the Spirit can do that. So we left off at Genesis 3, 6, so I just wanted to tie it in. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance, and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, right? Lust of the, what? Eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Yeah, you read it in 1 John. That's, that's the biggies, the, the three biggies. She took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loins loose. This is very sad. Sad, 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 sad. And what's so sad is that this is the first sin, and the result of this first sin was a sense of shame and fear. Shame and fear. And this is sad because the, right at the end of Genesis 2, the man and the women were naked, and they were unafraid, and unashamed. Now it's the exact antithesis. Now they're afraid and ashamed. Shame and fear are horrible emotions. Horrible. Shame is mentioned over a hundred times in our Bible. And it is this painful feeling that arises from the consciousness, from the awareness of something dishonorable and improper. When you know you've done something dishonorable and inappropriate or improper, you get this feeling of shame, which is good. But if we didn't do those things, we wouldn't have to deal with that feeling, right? Okay, it's good because it helps us change. If there's no guilt, there's no repentance. If there's no repentance, there's no change. So if you never repent, you'll never have a change. If there's no guilt, you'll never be able to repent. So people say guilt is bad. No, sweet pea. Guilt is good, but you don't want to carry around the guilt for longer than you need to. This, this feeling of shame brings on these feelings of guilt, humiliation, and self-disgust. You abhor yourself. You start to hate yourself. Now, fear is mentioned over 200 times. Over 100 times, Yeshua says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. We, we must be dealing with this emotion on a regular basis. And it's best described in my book as this distressing emotion that's aroused from impending danger, evil, or pain. What accompanies fear are feelings of anxiety, distress, and intense worry. We know people are dealing with this. Just ask any physician how many times he has to dispense of drugs for anxiety and intense worry. So we're dealing with shame and fear, but at an overwhelming rate, if you ask me. Shame and fear makes you feel terrible about yourself. You're always thinking something really bad is going to happen. Any of you go through that? Too many of you go through that. It's always something bad is going to happen. You go out to the store, something's going to happen. You're going to get a flat. Somebody's going to hit you. It's always bad. Always bad, always bad, always bad. At one time, this couple knew no good nor no evil, right? They didn't know any good, 
but they didn't know any evil. It's almost like they knew nothing except God. They only knew him, right? And they were covered with his innocence and his glory. Covered in the glory of God. Feeling totally innocent. No consciousness of any shame, fear, or guilt. Okay? Peace personified. Total peace. It's, it's as if once they ate this fruit, once they sinned, they lost their covering. It's almost like they were disconnected from God. Everything was beautiful. Everything was perfect. And all of a sudden, at that moment, these horrible emotions started to rise up in them. And now, instead of being covered with God's innocence and glory, they're covered with shame and guilt, which is anything but feeling peace. We've all experienced it. It says their eyes was open. Look at the word. It's real simple. Open their physical eyes. But what I'm saying, or what I'd like to express to you, is I don't think it's good to see too much. Yeah. Lust of the eyes. I don't think it's too good to keep looking. You, you, you look long enough at the menu, you're going to order. In fact, we have to guard our gates, our ears and our eyes. We have to guard them. We have to, we have to filter certain things out. And for our children, we have to be their filter. We are commanded to walk by faith and not by sight. And we ought to pray, God, open the eyes of my heart, O Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. We sing the song. What are we singing? We're saying, Father, give me a heart that's tender to your ways, that's tender to your commands, that's tender to your will, that's tender to your heart, Father God. And then we have to follow his lead with our heart and not our head. It says they put on loincloths, very simple. Coverings for the genitalia. If any of your children are here and they're 10 years old and they don't know what genitalia is, my feeling is you did a bad job. Okay? My kids knew the, the, the names of the organs when they were three and four years old. By the time they were three, they'd say, I have to urinate. People looked at me like I was wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. I should talk to them like an idiot. I mean, some of you adults are still saying I got to pee. Sad. Grow up. It's a bodily function. Use the proper terminology. Grow up. The fig leaves were used by man to hide the shame and take away the guilt. This works about as well as when our kids used to hide themselves under the blanket. Remember, Burn? You guys remember? You did it just yesterday. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but they would always hide under the blanket, remember? And what would we always do? You'd pound them out. We'd always say, this blanket's really lumpy. And we'd both lay down, and then they'd start to suffocate, and then that was time we had to get up, right? Or better yet, when a real little child, what do they do when they don't want you to see them, a two-year-old? Oh, I can still see you. The fig leaves don't work. The coverings that we use, they don't work, guys. No, you can cover yourself, but you can't take away the shame or the guilt. It doesn't work. Spiritually, the fig leaves represent Man's attempt to save themselves by a bloodless religion of good works. Religion will always be man's way to get to God. Yeshua will always be God's way to get to man. When you understand the crucifixion to the extent that I think you should, you realize two things. Sin is horrific and we shouldn't do it. But by the same token, we have tremendous redemptive value, and God has a better plan for our life. And he could turn ashes into beauty. And he could turn the oil of mourning into the oil of joy. And he could take off the garment of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. Yes, that's what God does that we can't, and that's the greatness and beauty of God. So what do they do? Their eyes were open, sadly enough. They're ashamed. They're full of fear and guilt. 
They put on these fig leaves trying to cover themselves. And then they go into hiding. Sad. Look at Genesis 3.8. They heard the voice of Adonai God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. <sighs> there are people, I, I, I don't want to call them stupid, that's not nice. How about morons? That will argue <laughs> over whether it was evening or morning when God showed up. That's worth arguing over, right? Because that's going to change everything, right? They'll miss the whole thing. They'll miss the forest for the trees. Said. Theological brilliance. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Adonai God among the trees in the garden. So now the fig leaves aren't even working because now all of a sudden the Lord shows up as he did every day with them. They walked with him. They talked with him. They had beautiful fellowship, unbroken fellowship. And now all of a sudden they're in hiding. It, this is awful. This is incredibly sad. But the sad part is it happens to us all the time. That's the sad part. Nothing's new under the sun. So they go into hiding. Let's take a look at the word. It means to withdraw, to hide, or conceal. You know, like, like, can you really conceal your sin? You can conceal it from me. I can conceal it to you. But from the Lord? Doesn't work, man. Doesn't work. So sad that man started to hide things from God. Now they would go into feelings of insecurity, pain, and depression. I guess, I, I can only read into it, that they must have been under the impression that if the Lord found out what they did, he would be so disgusted with them that he would want nothing to do with them. And you can understand that, right? Because we've had people in our lives like that, teachers, mentors, siblings, parents, you name it, that they just weren't that forgiving. You know? It's kind of like you walked on eggshells. Some of our relationships like that at home. you got to walk on eggshells. And if you say one wrong thing, pull! <laughs> Let me tell you something. Listen to me. Listen to me really carefully. That person is going to have to answer for a lot. Don't you worry about it. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Don't you worry about it. But as they say pull and they shoot that person out of the sky, when they go to the mercy seat, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It initiates by being merciful, not by receiving mercy. You have to give before you get. So they thought God's done. They're done, right? Understandably so. A lot of people do, right? God's done with me. God's done. But I'm showing you that that's not the pattern. My opinion on how God works with us is not important. People do trust my opinion, but I never give it. You'll never hear, get all the tapes. Get all the tapes and find my opinion. You'll find my opinion in chapter and verse. I have the Bible to go by. That's my go-to book. Unless you could find me something more authoritative, more literarily authentic and accurate, more bibliographically correct, more internal and external evidence to prove its authenticity, I will revert to that book. But I'm not going to revert to something your grandmother told you. I'm going to use the Bible. So I'm using the Bible. So if you say I stand on the Bible, then you could believe what it's saying. And if you don't stand on the Bible, then I understand. Then you've got no business believing this. But all I can do is tell you what God said. And that's a matter of you believing what God said, right? Sound fair? Okay. So this is not what happened. Look at the next verse, 3.9. Adonai God called to the man, where are you? Now you know because you've been in church way longer than I've been a believer. He wasn't trying to figure out where they were like he didn't know. He's omniscient, right? He's all-knowing, correct? He's all-knowing. Many scriptures point to that. He's also omnipresent. He's everywhere. So if he's everywhere, what does that mean? Pascal said his center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. So he wasn't trying to figure out, where, where did they go? I misplaced them. So what is he saying? First of all, let's look at the word called. What did he do? He calls out. He cries out. He utters a loud sound or shouts out. He's not saying, where are you? He's like, where are you? Where are you, guys? Where'd you go? They were hiding, right? 
The word in Hebrew also means to invite. So listen to the inflection, okay? Do, do, do you understand that he was inviting us back to him? He was request, requesting our presence in a kindly manner. Let me show you the difference. Hey, Max, where are you? He's heard that before. And then he's heard, hey, Maxie, where are you? You hear the difference? I'm here to tell you that when the Lord was calling out to Adam and Eve, it was the latter, not the former. You understand? Just from what the word means, to invite. You don't invite somebody. Hey, you want to come to my party? It's going to be really good. You should really come. You better come. There are some people who will do that, and that's a party I don't want to attend. But that was not happening here, guys. It was not happening here. Okay? And when he said, where are you, it proved two major things. One, man was lost. Man is Adam. Where are you, Adam? What happened to you? What are you doing naked and ashamed? Why are you so guilty and hiding? Why are you wearing that funny fig leaf? Where did the glory go? Where did the innocence go? My son, my daughter, you're depressed. I don't want you to be depressed. Man. So man was lost, make no mistake, and they still are. Two, God had come to seek and save, which is exactly why Yeshua came. Luke 19.10. What is your mission? I've come to seek and save. If you want to be part of his mission... Why don't you stop studying and come to seek and save? You can't study the wheelchairs to Israel. The reason why I'm sending them, is it a hook? No, it's because I care about children, especially children with disabilities. But is it going to be a hook? I'm sure. You think Greg Hirschberg, a Messianic Jew, is going to meet people from the Knesset? But I will meet them, and they'll say, you're Messianic, and I'll say, yes. Yes, I absolutely believe that Messiah has already come. But I'm a Jew, buddy, and you can't take that away from me. And this isn't about me being messianic or not messianic. This is about me helping the children in the name of Messiah. God took the initiative in salvation, which was demonstrating the very thing that Satan got Eve to doubt. And that's his love. And that's his number one weapon. It's not temptation. It's to get you to believe that he doesn't love you. It's to get you to believe that you have been divinely betrayed by the almighty creator and sustainer of the universe. That is his number one form of deception. Next verse, 310. He answered, this is Adam. I heard your voice in the garden. Of course he knew the voice of the Lord. They were very intimate, right? A voice is something very distinctive about somebody, more distinctive than their gait, more distinctive than their characteristics. I heard your voice, Lord. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. You know what? Maybe that show on TV has some biblical merit. I don't know. Naked and afraid. So here they were, and he's in hiding, yes? Because why? He's afraid like, like some little kid who has a monster parent. Like every time the parent comes home, the parent's pissed off at the kid. Every time, because it's the kid's fault that his life sucks. It's never the kid's fault. The kids aren't the problem. And they didn't ask to come here, just for the record. You did that, remember? Yeah, you should have thought about it before you did it. It's a big responsibility, but they deserve to be loved and cared for and protected. Every child deserves that. In fact, um, I heard from Nevin Pale, this is crazy. This is an ultra-Orthodox Jewish facility. Many of you have been there, right? Okay. And we'll go there again. And so they're building, we're building a wall. It's a prayer wall, a meditation wall in the center of the facility, a huge facility. And it's going to be a place where the kids can go and maybe pray and meditate. And on the wall, they're putting a plaque of, of course, Hava Levine the founder, and of course, Jack Stromfeld, who is 101 years old and who raised all this money on his own just going door to door. 
and they want to put a plaque up of Beth Yeshua. And I was against it because, you know, we're trying to do it on the humble side. And then the Lord says, this is an ultra-Orthodox Jewish facility, Greg, with tons of Jewish people come all over the nation of Israel. You don't want it to say Beth Yeshua, House of Jesus, at the facility? He said, I kind of did that. So they're doing that, and um, then um, Bill Foster, Foster Foundation, said, do you have a, a quote that you'd like to say on the plaque? So me and Bill are friends now. We, we operate the same way. We're crazy. We're aggressive. We want to help. And so I said, yeah, Bill, how about um, I believe the children are our future? <laughs> Treat them well and let them lead the way. And um, show them all the beauty they possess inside. And he said, isn't that a song? I said, no, no. But, you know, Bill, you've got to give them a sense of pride <laughs> to make it easier. Bill, let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. He goes, that's a song. I said, no. <laughs> okay, let's continue on. So they're afraid, they're naked, they're ashamed, they're guilty, miserable, horrible, horrific, right? Genesis 3, 11 through 13, here we go. He said, this is the Lord, who told you that you were naked? Who told you? Who told you about your guilt? Who told you that you're no good? See, see a parent? See a loving parent? Who said that? That teacher said you were stupid? I'm going to go up there. and t Right? You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, my day it was different. Yeah, my dad would have just knocked the teacher out. <laughs> anyway, my mother was a teacher. My sister a teacher. I'm a teacher. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful calling. Genesis 3, 11 through 13, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I ordered you not to eat? Like he didn't know. He's trying to get him to repent and come clean. He wants him to feel good about himself. Right? You see that? He knows. He just wants him to admit it so he can clean it out, get him back in the game. That's all God wants. It's like if you don't repent, you think by not repenting, he doesn't know what you've done? It's the silliest thing in the world. He's begging you to repent so he can clean you up, and you're saying, no, because that will mean he'll know. <laughs> Crazy human race. The man replied, here we go. Thus beginneth the blameth, gameth. Some of you recovering Baptists, I want to give you the King James Version. Look at this. He, he can't take blame. People today can't take blame. It's the government's fault. It's the school's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my kid's fault. It's my car. My God. Look, the woman you gave. It's not even the woman did it. The woman you gave me. He's blaming God. This is on you. Maybe if you would have used like a femur, but you only used a rib. The woman you gave me. She gave me the fruit. Can you see him? Yeah. He's kind of accusing God. You might not see it that way. I don't think he's going, well, it was the woman. He's saying, he's getting all bowed up. He's like, you know what? Okay, you found me out. I'm naked with this silly fig leaf behind the tree. I'm coming out. Let's talk. <laughs> you want to know? It was the woman. Then I don't know. He goes to the woman. He's like, okay, let me see if she'll confess. What is this you have done, Eve? What does she say? The one answered, it's not me, it's the serpent. And you put him in the garden. You see the blame game? You see how it started from the beginning of time? And it hasn't ended. You guys, even some of you older guys, you don't know how to take the blame. You don't know how to say you're sorry. And when you do say you're sorry, you don't do it right. Well, I'm sorry, but if you didn't say, stop it. It's on you. She didn't make you act like that. You did. It's crazy. Look at Proverbs 19.3. I just threw this in there as a bonus. A person's own folly is what ruins his way, but he rages in his heart against Adonai. So the Lord tells you not to do something. You do it, then face consequences, and you shake your fist at God and go, what's going on? It's monstrous, if not incredibly illogical to go against God's ways and then blame him for the result. I would never want to be God. 
First of all, I can't even manage my household, no less the universe. But putting that aside, we have an impeccable way about ourselves. When things go right, we want the plaque. And when things go wrong, God gets the blame. How would you like to be God? <sighs> Crazy. Men make a mess out of their lives and then shake their fist at the Lord. You didn't listen to him, man. That's the problem. But it's always best to take responsibility. Look what David said in Psalm 32, 5. When I acknowledge my sin to you, when I acknowledge, when I came clean, when I stopped concealing, hiding with the fig leaf, and said, I will confess my offense. Not, look what it says. You forgave, does it say you forgave my sin? No, it's not, it's not a problem forgiving. It's the guilt that will kill you, not the sin itself. God wants to remove the guilt of our sin. Some of you have never had that happen. There's all kinds of psychological reasons why, but still carrying around something from 40 years ago. Don't really quite understand that, but it can only be that you don't believe that God loves you. That's the only reason, no other reason. Genesis 3.15, this is called proto. Any, any, any Bible school folks here? Anybody graduate from Bible college? I'm going to make you really happy. Ready? This is called proto-evangelium. Isn't that cool? Proto-evangelium. Seven syllables. That will make you smart. Do you know what it means? Proto-evangelism? Take a, take, a, take a guess. Proto is what? First? First? Third? Did you say third? First? And evangelium comes from evangelical gospel. It's the first gospel. Yeah. This is the first messianic prophecy in the whole Bible. The very first one right here, right here in Genesis 3. Look, now it switches. God's done with Adam for a minute. He's done with Eve. Who does he go to speak to? The devil. He's like, okay. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the devil. I'll go talk to the devil. Maybe he'll take responsibility. So... The Lord speaks to him, and this is very well known in evangelical circles and theological circles. And he says, I will put animosity, that's a fancy word for hatred. I will put hate between you, the devil, and the woman, okay? And between your descendant, or some of your scriptures will say your seed, and her seed. Isn't it interesting that it says her seed? A woman doesn't have a seed, she has an egg. So who is he speaking about? Messiah. And is it plural, her seeds, her children? Singular. So he's talking about Messiah. I will put hatred, animosity between your seed, who's his seed? The anti-Messiah and her seed. And what is, who is the woman? In Revelation, who is the woman? Israel. Israel. He's not talking about Eve. Israel's going to birth who? Messiah. The Messiah. So do you think Satan's going to hate Israel? Yes, Satan hates Israel more than any people on the face of the earth. He hates the Jews. And guess what? If you don't like the Jews, then, you, then you're following Satan. Just that simple. You're saying that because you're Jewish. No, I'm saying that because I love the Lord. It's got nothing to do with me being Jewish. I, my parents are Jewish. I was born Jewish. So what? It's got nothing to do with it. It's biblical. And any of you that move in replacement theology... It's not bad doctrine, it's demonic doctrine. And you can tell that to your pastor who has his doctorate. I have no problem telling it to him as well. I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. He, the Messiah, will bruise your head, Satan, but you will bruise his heel. What does all that mean? Oh, I'd love to tell you. It predicts perpetual hostility. Perpetual hostility between Satan and the woman, Satan and Israel, and anybody who's grafted in. Okay? Perpetual. It's never going to stop. Never. He's never going to stop. If you think, oh, well, I just get some breathing room. No! It's never going to happen. It's going to be a fight all the time. This represents all mankind between Satan's descendant, the anti Messiah, and the woman's descendant, the Messiah. The woman's seed would crush the devil's head, meaning a mortal wound, spelling utter defeat. This wound was inflicted at Golgotha. Okay? When Yeshua triumphed over the devil. 
Satan, in turn, would bruise Messiah's heel. The heel wound here speaks of suffering, and it speaks of physical death, but not ultimate defeat. That's the difference in Hebraic reckoning. Yeshua did, in fact, suffer, and he did, in fact, die, but he did not stay dead now, did he? So this prophecy did, was fulfilled, yes? Do you see? I want, I want you to see something that you'll probably never see in a million years and you'll never hear. Do you see the tender loving kindness in God announcing the promise of Messiah prior to pronouncing the sentence on man and the woman? They had sinned. Yes, you do now. You're going to see what he pronounces on the man and the woman. That's next verse. But do you see God's love? Before he says, this is what's going to happen to you, Adam and Eve, for your sin, he prophesies that a Messiah is going to come to free them forever and give them eternal life. Is that not love? Can you imagine if every time you went to hit your kid, you said, I'm going to buy you a bike tomorrow, but today I'm going to beat you. It's a little nicer. You get handled beating. Do you see this now? Is that beautiful? This is something you'll miss when you memorize Scripture. This is something you'll miss when you try to rush through the Bible just to get it in you. You follow? Just to get through it. You don't want to get through it. You want it to get through you. You want to put yourself there. Go into the garden. Go into the tree. Throw in a fig leaf if nobody's home. I don't know. But go into character. Feel it. You've got to feel God. You've got to feel what's going on. Because if you feel it, you can live it and understand it. You've got to feel it, man. Now, now though, he pronounces his verdict on man and woman. Look, 16 through 19, we're almost home. Ah, you got plenty of time. When sundown? <laughs> you know, the churches, they used to preach back in the day at least an hour. Then they went to 45 minutes because they bought into the fact that you guys can't handle it. Then now it's 30 minutes. Soon it's going to be 20 minutes. Soon it's going to be 20 minutes, and then it's going to be 10 minutes. It's going to be a drive-by. It's amazing. They think you can't handle it, but you can play video games for eight hours. Or binge on movies. Three of them in a row. But you can't listen to the Word of God for 30 minutes. You know what I'm doing? I'm not buying into that crap. That's what I'm not doing. Okay. Here's Genesis 3, 16 through 19. Um, to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. You will bring forth children in pain. Okay. That was not supposed to happen. Now, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you a little story. Bernadette and I, we had no family in Florida when the Lord moved us to Florida. We were incredibly strong believers and, and very innocent in our walk. And she got pregnant. I, I, you got pregnant, right? <laughs> she got pregnant, and we had no family, no friends, no nothing, and we had no money. So when we went to see the doctor... Um, he said, look, I, I, I was always working out deals. I was working in the gym, so I go, do, do, you, do you ever think of personally training? And how many deals did I work out with that? Tons. I was just bartering. I was just bartering my services. And, and he said, well, you know, is she going to have an epidural? And I said, what's that? And they said, well, that's a shot to make her relax and she can. And I was like, oh, that's not natural, is it? I said, is there, is there any side effects to that? And we were like, we were such organic heads. We were, we were organic heads. We were juicing carrot juice three times a day. She was orange. She was orange. If you drink enough of it, your skin will turn orange. It's true, from the pigment, from the vitamin A in it. So um, he said, well, one out of like 20,000 could get paralyzed. I was like, we could be that one out of 20,000. We're not doing it. Plus, I had no money. Back then, it was like 1,100 bucks or 1,200 bucks for the shot back 25 years ago. So we didn't do it. So first, we're in the parking lot, right? Remember you drank that raspberry drink I made for you that was supposed to give you no pain, and you threw it up all over the place? Remember? And let me just tell you, I got every disease in the book, and it, I ate organically, right? And so, so who's dead? Dr. Pritikin, Dr. Jim Fix, remember the running doctor? He wrote the book Running, cardiologist, dies of a heart attack. Dr. Atkins, who's dead? So who's alive? Chubby Checker, Fats Domino? What does that tell you? <laughs> Biggie Small would have been alive if he didn't get capped. So she throws up this stuff, and then we go in, and then they're, 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 they give us the bedroom because we have no money, and they put that Worldwide Res Wrestling Federation belt on you, right? And you're crying, you're miserable, and, but you're trying to hang in there, and we have a birthing plan. You know what a birthing plan is? No lights, 
Kenny G, the wedding song was going to play. And I was going to hold her left hand. We had, we had a, you know, I showed the doctor, listen, this is our plan. You got to follow our plan, right? How long did that plan last? All of a sudden, the pain was so bad. And Jeremy was so big and Burn was so small. She looks at me and goes, can I have an epidural, honey? And I'm like, I got $11 to my name, but I, I figured I'll, I'll just work somebody out. So I look at her and I go, okay, slacker, you know? I didn't say slacker. I said slacker, but I didn't say it loud. I said it under my breath. I said, okay, honey, slacker. And then all of a sudden, remember the doctor goes, I'm sorry, it's too late. And that's when... That's when you brought me back to 14. It was 1973. I'm in the movie theater, and I'm watching Linda Blair and The Exorcist. Your head started to spin. Green bile was shooting all over the place. I'm trying to cast every demon out of you, right? You, you, you called me by a name, but it wasn't Greg. Remember? Remember? I thought some drunk sailor was giving birth. So... What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, this is true. And she did the next two like that. And then by Lily, she said, let's try an epidural. You were filing your nails while Lily was coming out. She out, right? You were talking to them. I was like, wow. And you looked at me, remember, and you're like, thanks a lot. So, so this is true. I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. You know, this is before the drugs, guys. Right? Now we got all these drugs to help us, but that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, actually. So let's experience this. And I think it's good to experience the pain because once they give birth, the pain never stops, does it? <laughs> it's just God's way of saying they're going to bring pain into your life. Okay. You'll bring forth children in pain. Your desire will be towards your husband, but he will rule over you. What does that mean? You've got to understand this, guys. You've got to read this stuff. You've got to know what it's saying. What does that mean? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Some of you have doctorates. What does this mean? Your desire will be to your husband. The, listen, the sad part about this was that the woman would have desires to oppose her husband. Now, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Huh, all the men are going, yep. Huh, sure do know what I'm talking about. Yeah, just this desire, this crazy freakish desire in the flesh to just oppose the husband. You know what I mean? Hey, it's a nice day. It's not a nice day. Okay? And the man, the man would abandon his pre-fall leading, guarding, and caring to be domineering. So the man would want to dominate and the woman would want to oppose. How's that working? We know the divorce rate. It doesn't work. So how, how will it work? You have to decide to be so sold out and surrendered to the Lord that his spirit would take over in your tabernacle. Rabbi, I, I do do that, but my wife or my husband doesn't. I know. That's sad. That's the worst. But you know what? You still ought to do it. Because one day you're going to sit before the judgment seat of Messiah, every believer. And you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And maybe some of you husbands, some of you wives might not hear that. You might hear, you're going to carry her bags throughout eternity. You see, I can't make any of you do that. But if you do that then you won't oppose. And if you do that, you won't be domineering. You'll be loving, caring, and kind. And it's sad when just one is doing that. It's so sad when one is sold out to the Lord and the other one isn't. It's very, very hard. Very, very hard. And um, I know you might be saying that's me. But you know what? Kudos to you for serving the Lord the way you should be serving the Lord. It's not about you and her or you and him. It's about you and him. Yep, and then he says, you are not to eat from it. The ground is cursed on your account. You'll work the ground, thorn and thistles. And so, not only this, but the man would earn his living, sadly enough, by the sweat of his brow. We don't have that as much anymore, but that's the way it used to be, work in the land. And at the end of their lives, you'll return to the dust. Now, let me just, let me just say something. People always call me and ask me this question, so let me get it out of the way. How does God feel about cremation? First of all, people cremate for one major reason, for the most part. It's cheap, which is a sad state of affairs. Okay? They also say that it's, it's environmentally safe. No, it puts out over one million 
BTUs of thermal energy, which causes more than 32% of all the mercury in the air. It's incredibly environmentally safe. Poison, poison, poison. So um, Jews, look, I can just tell you from a Jewish perspective, we just don't cremate. Because we believe that the body and the soul is married like a husband and wife. The soul is part of the body. And the soul lingers and can feel when the body's in pain. For three days. And there's no reason to do that. Some also say, well, we, 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 we move around a lot so we can't visit. Now some of you are saying, Rabbi, I cremated, what does that mean? No idea what it means, but you ask me a question. I get it all the time. I'm just saying we, we, we don't do it. And my mother passed away, my father passed away. They guard the body for 24 hours. Somebody will not leave that body. That's how sacred God feels about that body. It housed the soul. It housed the spirit of the Lord. We don't want to hear it crackle and shrivel in a fire. Plus, our people went through enough of that in the crematoriums during the Holocaust. So it says here, you were made from dust, and dust you should return. When you're at a funeral and you open up the ground, it's like a tear in the earth. It's like a tear in the heart of God. It's like a tear in our hearts. Something's not right. But that's not where it's going to end. So if you ever ask me, that's where I stand. Your decision is your decision on everything in life. But I got news for you. Sometimes even people say, well, my mother wanted it that way. You know what? I don't care what mom wants. I care what God wants. Amen. I'm not looking to please my mother, although I will honor my mother, but I'll honor God before I honor my mother. All right. We ready? Ready to finish? Yes. We're dying for you to finish. Good. <laughs> then let's finish. Genesis 3.21. Adonai God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Okay, garments. Let's take a look. In Hebrew, it means a tunic or an undergarment, a full undergarment, okay? Not a little covering for the genitalia, a full, fully covered, like the garments of salvation in Isaiah 61. Skin, this is interesting. Skin or hide. But in Hebrew, if it's hide, it's the hide of animals. If it's skin, it's the skin of men. He didn't say he would provide a hide, garments of hide. He said garments of skin. So he's speaking to me prophetically, Right? The skin of a man. Did God provide Adam and Eve with the skin of a man? No. Did he provide you and I with the skin of a man? Yes, he did. He sure did. First and foremost, this shows that God absolutely loved them and still absolutely cared for them. First and foremost. The animal skins not only picture the sacrificial system that Moses installed, right, to atone for sin, but do you see the parallel with the robe of righteousness which God provided for Yeshua? Genesis 3, 22, 23, another thing I want you to see. It says, Adonai God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now to prevent his putting out his hand and taking also from the tree of life, eating and living forever. And then he doesn't even finish the sentence. Therefore, Adonai God sent him out of the Garden of Eden. It sounds almost mean, right? Because when you look at the word sent, it means to drive out forcefully. It doesn't mean, now, now go ahead. It's like he pushed him out forcefully. Now, why did he do that? Okay. God doesn't even finish the sentence. You see? You see? You see now? He doesn't finish the sentence. Look. See? Say yes. Tell me. Do you see? Yes. If you don't, I'll explain it to you. He doesn't finish the sentence. Time is of the essence. Why? Do you see what would happen if they ate from the tree of life? They would stay in that state. Depressed, guilty, sick forever. Forever. That's what the, we are going to eat from the tree of life, but not now. No, they would be, live forever in bodies subject to sickness, to generation, and infirmity. So God's got to act quickly. He can't waste any time. He's got to prevent this unbearable thought. So see what God's love? When preventing them from going back to Eden, listen to me. When there is a cherub with a flaming sword, why you keep trying to eat from that behind it? Sometimes when you keep pushing, God will go, Okay, you want a king? You want Saul? Okay. He's not going to force you because forced love is rape, but why don't you just defer to him? He, Father knows best. He knows best. Our lives are ruined because of decisions we made apart from him or decisions somebody made for us apart from him. But Father knows best. If you and I could ever believe that everything God tells us to do, good would come out of it. If we could believe that, we'd be free, even if it's not good for us. 
You mean to tell me, God, this is happening to me, but it's not going to be good for me, but it might be good for him? Yes. Sometimes you plant a tree, but you never get to sit in its shade. But as long as somebody does, it's a good thing, isn't it? So he says, don't go for it. But more importantly, in the original Hebrew, it doesn't say, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. I thought he was made in God's image. I thought he was like God. It's hayetha. It means the man who was like one of us in purity and in wisdom has fallen. The man had a fall, and he was robbed of his excellence. The serpent is a thief. He robbed us. So what does God do? Does he point his finger and shake it? No. He runs to the rescue to restore what the enemy has tried to devour, namely our goodness, and he's doing that as we speak. Look, last two verses, Genesis 2, 16, 17. Adonai gave the person this order. You may freely eat from every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are not to eat from it because on the day that you eat from it, it will become certain that you will die. Now, was God lying or was Satan lying? Obviously, Satan was lying because you can go to every cemetery and see that Satan was lying. The billions and billions of headstones and footstones and tombstones declare that God was not lying. But more importantly, we look at this physically, right? Well, now death came on the scene. No, death was progressive for Adam and Eve. Spiritual death was instantaneous. And this is what happens to us when we sin. We spiritually die. But we don't have to stay dead, do we? Every single believer, I'm no statistician, but every one of you, no matter what you do, no matter how much creams you buy and lotions, you will wrinkle and you will shrivel and you will die. And you will be put in the earth and you will decompose. But you don't have to die forever. That's the beauty of this message. Adam and Eve had to decide whether God or Satan was lying. They decided that God was. But in spite of their decision, God still provided animal skins, which pictures the garment of salvation, which God would provide. For his love provides what his holiness requires. His love provided what his holiness demanded or required. The, the message of God's love is better to be born twice and die once than to be born once and die twice. Better to be born twice. I'm no evangelist. I don't purport to be, but if you have never come before God and repented of your sins and you have never Ask the Lord to house you with his Holy Spirit so he can guide you and direct you through life. To connect with the Lord so he could bring peace and joy into your life. My life was anything but joyous. Was it fun? Yes. People tell me all the time, you weren't having fun. No. I, I wasn't having fun on private planes. I wasn't having fun at Club Med. No. It was horrible. Detestable. Yes, of course I was having fun. But it was fleeting. And it wasn't bringing me what I really needed. Now I'm having fun. Now my greatest day is sitting at the table with my wife and kids and eating and just looking at them. They don't even have to be talking to me. And I'm like, I feel like a rich man. Then I had money. Then I had money to burn. But now I feel like a rich man. I had anything but peace. Now I have peace personified. And I have a God who's available 24-7. And not just a God, but the God the lover of my soul, the fairest among 10,000, who only wants the best for me. And even when I go through horrific situations, horrible, detestable things, I could still somehow believe that his mercy is new every morning. I could raise my hand and say, God, this is killing me. But I know you love me. I'm not going to let the enemy kill me off. I know you love me. And I love you. Help me to stay close to you. And help me to love you more. There, youngins, there is nothing greater. You might not agree. You might want to experience like I did. Knock yourself out, can't stop it. But you're going to come back, and you're going to tell me someday, you know what, I agree with you. There's nothing greater than having a relationship with Almighty God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together.
I think, um, I think we're just about full on that bus. We got an extra long bus. I think it holds like maybe 58, I think, 58 seats. And I think we have 56 or 57. So if you still want to go there, there might be a, a little bit of room. It's, it's going to be a, a humdinger, this one. This one's not going to be like any, any other one. But I think there's one or two more. So if you watch and say, hey, I really feel like I should go, then, then jump on it because it's going to close down pretty soon. Um, I love you. I'm really happy to, to, uh, to be part of Beth Yeshua. A lot of people say I'm happy to be your pastor. I mean, the Lord, the Lord is your shepherd, not me. You know, let's be honest. The Lord is your shepherd. But um, I'm, I'm ecstatic uh, to be part of this place. And every time I drive by, which is a ton because I live right across the street, I just, I just shake my head. I just, I, I just can't believe it. Some of you are part of big churches. There's no big places in Messianic Judaism. They're all tiny, and they do whatever they can, but they're beautiful, and they have family-oriented. And I just look at what God's doing. I mean, this is crazy. I'm going to go over there and just be like, what the heck? God, this happened. They're shaking hands and say, oh, you did? And I'm like, no, no. I don't even understand it. You don't, you don't get it. But, but, man, I'm so glad the Lord did it. So, so uh, don't take things for granted, you know? Don't, don't ever take this place for granted, man. If you do, let me make a recommendation that is really coming from my heart, okay? If you don't get what God's doing, please go someplace else for a little while. And after you go to that other place, you, you might get it then, okay? You, you, you owe that to yourself. You owe that to the Lord. You owe it to us. Because I, I, just, I just don't want to shortchange God on his worship and what he's doing. I want to honor him because he's great, and he's greatly to be praised in this place. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. There'll be people up here praying for you if you need prayer. I'll be up here and I'm more than willing to give out free hugs. Have a great weekend. Shabbat Shalom.